Thank you for joining us, and uh, we're going to have a really interesting session today. Just one note uh, is that um, you can actually buy Dealing with China, Hank's book, and he will do a signing afterwards, uh, after the session. But if you want to you know, get ahead and get a book now, you're welcome to as well. So we're going to start now. I just want to preface that I have read the book and thought that it was really interesting, very intriguing. And I have to say that um, I do think that, Hank, you are the Henry of our time, I mean, in the best sense, uh, and with an allusion to Henry Kissinger. So I think that uh, uh, you are the, basically the statesman for our time. So congratulations. My first question is, you write that after leaving office, you lost your sense of joy and purpose. You know, you cited some surveys that said that um, Americans believe that torture was better than TARP, and you talked about many sleepless nights. Yet Zhou Xiaotren, who was a very senior leader, he's a basically the central banker in China and a very good friend of Hank's, um, he said that, you know, you never know when you might have an opportunity to make a difference. Do you have any regrets? And if so, what are they? Okay, well, Cheryl, first of all, thank you very much for being here and doing this, and thank, thank all of you. I spent a lot of time writing the book and a lot of sweat, blood, and tears into it, so it's, it's, it's an honor to be interviewed by a, a, an author who I admire and is, really understands China and uh, is a first-rate author. Now, d do I have regrets? So, you're, so you're, you're talking about my time at Treasury. So the, um, first of all, you are right. At Treasury or in dealing with China, basically the scope of the book. Oh, yeah. And, and so in, in terms of, uh, of the, my time at Treasury, because what, what, what Cheryl was talking about was, you know, I spent two and a half years there the, you know, people would say to me all the time, gee, it must have been really tough during the crisis. And it was tough, but it's, I, I've been through crises before, and as I say often, if you're boiling in oil, it really doesn't make much difference if it's 150 degrees or 180 or 90. We're all dealing with those kinds of things. And I'm better playing offense than defense. And so it was actually when I stepped down and when I was, hearing the criticism, and I, I basically felt like most of the big things we did, we got basically right, we made, we, we made mistakes, but that we would prevented a far worse outcome. And so hearing that and then reliving it and writing the book was a, was a, what was a difficult period of time. And, and so it was then that I decided I, you know, looking ahead after I finished, what could I do? And I wanted to do something where I really made a difference, and, and I picked China. But to get to your question about regrets, yeah, in terms of my time, I tend to look forward more than back. And so I'm not someone that spends a lot of time saying, I wish I'd done this or that. But in terms of my time at Treasury, I believe that the basic big decisions we made were, were by and large right that when you're dealing with a big, ugly, messy problem, there's never a neat, elegant, perfect solution. But the reason I can say that now is because when we made mistakes, we corrected them right there on the battlefield. Because when you're dealing with a crisis, you, what you're doing is you're trading off doing something which is imperfect and with imperfect information against doing nothing, which often can be worse. So the key is when you get new information to correct it. So if I would cite the two things we corrected, where we made mistakes and we corrected them, were first with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. I went to Congress. I asked for unlimited, I couldn't ask for unlimited authority, so I asked for unspecified. And I got, got unspecified. But I said I hoped that if we had that, I expected we wouldn't have to take the, the bazooka out of the pocket. But when the situation worsened, we did that. I very famously went to Congress and said that, uh, th that we weren't going to put capital in the banks, we were going to buy illiquid assets, because the only program I'd ever heard of in terms of dealing with, with banks during crises 
was to nationalize them. And, uh, but when the situation changed, I went to President Bush and I said, guess what? We're going to have to, to, to do something different. And he, he said, gee, you told the whole world you were going to buy illiquid assets. I said, I know, but that's not going to work. So he said, do what you want to do. So most, uh, what you need to do to save the economy. So I would say most of the mistakes that we made were communications mistakes. And I, I think, or mistakes were, were, some people would cite Lehman as a mistake because they would say, Ben, Tim, and I decided to let Lehman, Lehman fail. And, and in retrospect, do you think that you would have made that decision still? Yeah, we didn't make a decision. We didn't make a decision let it, to right. let him fail. Right. That's, you know, it's an interesting thing, Cheryl, because I think most people that know us don't think that Ben, Tim, and I are prone to not telling the truth. And yet all three of us have said we couldn't find a single power we could use to save a failing investment bank. And we, had, we, we you know, at the time when Bear Stearns was going down, we learned then that a loan from the Fed or a loan in the midst of a run on an investment bank doesn't work, it disintegrates. If we hadn't had a buyer there uh, before the weekend was out, we would have lost Bear Stearns. And we went, we talked with Congress, we talked with Barney Frank, we explained that we didn't have the wind down authorities we need. He said, you won't be able to get them unless you come up here and say that if you don't have them, you're going to have a, a disaster on your hands. Lehman will fail, and he'll take down the financial system. And, right. and, and we said, if we say that, they'll go down the next day. So again, yeah, I think I didn't have you know, any major regrets in terms of my time at Treasury. And one of the things I was proudest of at Treasury was starting the strategic wow. economic dialogue with China. Right. because. Right at the beginning, when I t talked with President Bush and he was uh, making the case that I should come to, to, to join him, uh, I, at that time, I said that I'd done a lot of work with China and I really believe we needed a better way to deal with China strategically in order to help get important things done. And so we designed and set up the Strategic Economic Dialogue. Right, yes, and I want to actually get into a little bit of that. So. It seems to me as though there's a little bit of a disconnect. Um, I thought that you had an excellent description of the way you developed the, uh, uh, the strategic economic dialogue. And it was very inter interesting that you said you're very pragmatic in the approach. You start off with a big vision. Uh, you choose a, a concrete first step that can be accomplished quickly for early wins. And then you push relentlessly to a tight schedule. So that's how you started up. At that time, uh, in uh, 2007, I know that this strategic economic dialogue took a long time in gestation. Um, so around the time of the third SED, uh, when you had already had multiple discussions with the Chinese at uh, many, many levels. But in late 2007, um, we saw that the Chinese refused to let the Kitty Hawk dock in Hong Kong. I don't know if how many of you may have remembered that, um, but it was around Thanksgiving, and they were uh, hoping to let the American servicemen you know, stop in Hong Kong to meet their families for Thanksgiving. Um, presumably, China was angry about the U.S. planned sales to, of arms to Taiwan and President Bush's appearance with the Dalai Lama. And then Secretary of Defense Bob Gates visited China and said that, and emphasized, confirmed that the U.S. would continue selling arms to Taiwan. Chuck Schumer, meantime, and his colleagues uh, in Congress and Senate were actually talking about you know, pushing forth the bill that would label China as a currency manipulator. Um, and yet dialogue was happening at so many levels uh, with, in Ch with China through you. I mean, probably, you know, more than we had seen in years. So why, from the outside, people thought, well, Chinese relations were at a nadir. But from the inside, you were describing how there was so much dialogue on multiple levels is why is there a disconnect is was something not working or was it a public image problem or what well again things are never you're, you're not going to find a there's no panacea and the thing that i saw with the dialogue which was the dialogue i think put us in a much stronger position with china to get a lot of things done and it's and 
as I think you know, and as you've seen with, with, with China, there's a lot of people that are involved in the decision-making process. It's a very diffuse decision-making process. And so it takes consensus, at, at, you know, it takes some top-down decision-making to force consensus below, but we, we had a, a system that was designed to, to, to deal with all of the Chinese uh, uh, leaders that had specific responsibilities for a, a given issue, and many of those that didn't. And so I, you, you use currency as, as an example. And on currency, although the head of the central bank has direct responsibility for currency, uh, there are many, m many others in the Chinese government that, that, that have a role. And so by coming together with the SED, th this gave a mechanism for Ben Bernanke, who was over there with us, and a number of us to talk to a really broad group. The same with environmental issues and so on. So I if anybody thinks the SED or any dialogue is going to solve all the issues, they've got another thing coming. But it certainly helped us navigate a number of tricky issues, including the financial crisis. And it helped us put in place the 10-year framework for energy and the environment, which is, continues to play an important role today. Well, I've, I've always been a proponent of engagement with China. I right. think it's really important. And you clearly are in that camp as yeah. well. Yeah. But I just wonder, is it that maybe you could do, the government can do a better job at publicizing the wins that it has with, or the level of engagement that it has with China and that might change American opinion or is it just that difficult? Well, well I, I've got to tell you something. You can always do a better job communicating, but we communicated relentlessly our wins and I communicated them in the book and, and, we, and the Chinese uh, publicized them and they were very, very important because they kept track of all the deliverables and then they worked to achieve them. So it was, it, it was quite important. But the press always wants to, doesn't always want to write about the successes. And the currency issue was one that got a lot of attention. And I think there was a lot of progress made on the currency issue. Is there anything in those negotiations through the SED or the negotiations you've had with China that you would, have, that you want, would like to have changed? Oh, I, you know, there's all kinds of things I'd like to, 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 have, to, to have more success and get them to move quicker on. And I, I said continually and repeatedly to them, I thought that the accelerating the reforms to open up the economy to competition, the, the, the financial sector and other parts of the economy were, were, were key, and that there was more risk to them, and much more risk in going too slow than in going too quick. And what we had was we had a period of 10 years under, you know, under you know, Hu Qingtao and Wen Jiaobao when there was very diffuse leadership, a divided uh, standing committee, which is a top group, in which they didn't move ahead very quickly on reforms. But I think one of the things the SED did, let us get some things done that we couldn't have got done without doing it, and kept the relationship on an even keel as we went through the financial crisis. And so it is, it's 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 a very important uh, you know the you know to step back with the U.S. China I think this is by far our most important bilateral relationship and so it's I think if we spent more time dealing with China and working on that relationship some of the other crises we're dealing with around the world many of them would be easier to make progress on. And it's going to be much more difficult if we don't work with them. And it starts with the environment, sustaining global economic growth, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Okay, so um, given all of your experience with the Chinese, uh, is there something that you would have done differently in the way you negotiated with the Chinese? In terms now, as you look back, what are the lessons you learned? Uh, and then what advice would you give the new administration well, or the current administration on China well, policy? Well, I tell you, the, one of the biggest lessons I learned, and, and there's a whole series of them, but I'd say one of the biggest ones I learned is the importance of our own economic strength, how really, really important that is. And, you know, I, I, I saw that up close and personal. And, and there's a chapter where I write about the financial crisis through the eyes of the Chinese. And I'd been pressing them very hard to open up their financial sector to competition. 
not because I want to do a favor for my you know, former colleagues in the banking industry, but because I knew this was critically important to getting to the point where you're going to have a, a market-determined currency, where you're going to be able to, to treat the Chinese public fairly so that their, their savers can get a fair return, et cetera. And so during, in June of 2008, when my counterpart at the time, Wang Xishan, came over and met with us at Annapolis for the, for the Strategic Economic Dialogue, he said, we're, we're not being very successful. Because he said, Hank, you used to be my teacher. And my teacher doesn't look so smart anymore, given the problems with your financial system. And of course, I could explain, you know, gee, we made mistakes. You should learn from our mistakes. We, when we have a problem, we shine a light on it. We move quickly to clean it up, et cetera, et cetera. But if our system isn't performing well, and if we're not doing the things we need to do at home to, pro to demonstrate and project economic strength, it's hard to be a leader. Well, actually, that is very important because we do have a mess here in the US as well. So how do we go push China to continue with their reforms when actually, if you look at the US, we should be doing political and economic reforms here too? Right. Well, you, and have the Chinese told you that? Well, well you don't. So the interesting thing, which is th this, Cheryl, you're getting to just a key lesson, I think, on dealing with any uh, major sovereign foreign country or anyone, anyone on the other side. And that is, if you just go and push them, that doesn't work. And you have to listen, you have to find common ground, and you have to explain why it's in their best interest. I always explained why currency reform, why economic reform, and opening up the competition. And you need to, another big lesson is working with the people that are the, the reformers there. And, and you do things in complementary ways. Like I'll give you a, a couple of examples. Um, the first part of dealing with China tells the story of working with the then Premier Zhu Ranji and Zhang Zemin and using capital markets transactions, reforms, to bring capital and know-how, and it's a lever that they can use to, to reform their economy and do some things that were very, very difficult, laying off a whole lot of people to provide a greater benefit to the economy. WTO accession was something that the, was the lever that the reformers used to open up their economy. So today, what do we do? Bilateral investment treaty would be something that would be good for us and good for them. And it's a lever that the reformers can use to open up certain sectors of their economy to private sector competition, which will help them grow and create jobs and help American workers manufacture products that are sold to China and American companies do more investments there. So again, I think we have to be strategic about it and we have to listen and we have to figure out what realistically can be done and find common ground and then work to get things done. So Wang Qishan, who is now um, a vice premier, uh, he's on, actually he's on the, the Politburo, right? So He's on the Standing Committee and yeah, the Politburo. Yeah, he's on the Standing and the, and the Politburo. So um, he is the one who hinted to you that why should China follow the US model? Because obviously during the financial crisis, it showed a lot of strains and, and yeah. almost, um, almost collapsed. So, what can you actually tell the Chinese, given that you know right now you're not in a position to, as you, as you were then, to try and reform or uh, well, economically or politically our our own home turf? Well, I, I think the Chinese today understand that, that they've got plenty of their own issues when it comes to their economy, and you know they've got major structural issues. The the economic model they used to get them where they are now very successfully has run out of steam. The world has changed. They, they, they recognize they've got a broken municipal finance system that needs to be fixed and is piling up debt as they look to overinvest in infrastructure. They're too reliant on exports. They need to, 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 uh, to pull back and take away some of the advantages that the oligopolies have, the state-owned enterprises and put them on a level playing field. So they understand these things. And the great thing about going to China is when you have conversations with them, 
it, it's not like talking to some U.S. politicians who pretend they don't have problems. They recognize they have their problems. They're looking for best practices. They're looking to learn. And so I think there's never a problem going to China and talking in respectful ways about things that they can do that will, that will help their economy and help and also of mutual benefit to, 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 to America. You know, they're, they're, they're looking to act in their self-interest. They're going to act in their self-interest. We're going to act, and we should act in our self-interest, but it's in our self-interest to find areas where, where we can work in a complementary way and get things done. And, and the, the economies of both countries are, are, are great examples. You cite um, a, a poll in mid-2013 mid, uh, of American opinion that shows that um, American opinions of China have plunged 14 percentage points to about 37% uh, approval, while negative opinions among Chinese uh, you know, people of Americans, um, negative opinions rose to 53%. So that's a huge polarization. Xi Jinping has encouraged more nationalism, uh, even as his daughter graduated from Harvard. This makes it very hard to foster U.S.-Chinese relations. So how can we, what do you advise, uh, what would you advise, I mean, I'm sure you're giving advice too right now even, uh, to the current administration on what we can do to improve U.S.-Chinese relations? Well, Cheryl, it's, 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 the relationship is becoming more complex. It's, it's, it's a tougher issue. And, you know, that's the biggest reason why I wrote the book, uh, because I think it's, it, it's tough and it may get tougher. Because um, the consensus in America, which was if we help China, it's going to be good for America and good for China, is starting to break down. Because as we see China, you know, as a formidable competitor, as I said before. Um, and when you look at it, some, you know, some other things that are making it very, very difficult, the buildup of, of, of China's military, the uh, continued buildup. Uh, the, the, as you've said, this is a leader who's been very clear that he doesn't aspire to multi-party democracy or Western values. And so, again, this is a challenge. And uh, so I think, again, I'm going to come back and repeat myself, which is what we need to do, there are many areas where we have a common interest. And in those areas, having a shared interest means nothing if you can't get some things done, which are obvious to both publics, and they see the benefit in the relationship. And so we, we need to do things like, for instance, the climate agreement, climate change agreement that President Obama reached, you know, last November right. on the margins of, uh, of, of APEC. That's a very important very thing. Point. It demonstrates that both countries place, you know, importance on this relationship and we are, you know, working to get things done. I, I think uh, progress in the economic area, when, you, when, when Chinese people may be negative about China, but when Chinese actually make investments here, they create jobs, real jobs. And you see support for that at the local government level and, you know, and, and, and obviously in the communities where they create those jobs. And there are a growing number of those instances, so increasing those linkages. There's, there, there's you know, just a, a whole number of areas where we need to get some things done and it's really important. And then where there are differences, where we are competitors, I think it's very important that the competition not degenerate into destructive competition. There's nothing wrong with healthy competition. We shouldn't be afraid of it or shrink from it. So, so well, on a spectrum of collaboration versus competition, um, friend or foe, you know, we've We've always looked at China, uh, the relationship with China in those two different poles, but obviously there's a spectrum. So where are we on that spectrum now? Well, where we are is we're, they're, they're, it's, they're, they're, they're not a foe, they're not an ally, 
we're partnering. It's a complex relationship, so I'm not going to over, you know, go, going to oversimplify here. But there are some very positive things to look at. I mean, the fact that Xi Jinping not only visited, he's the, the, the Chinese president, general party secretary, he, we're going to have a state visit coming up. I think that's a, a, a very positive sign. I think the fact that we're in serious negotiations on a bilateral trade agreement, the fact that we're working together on climate change, there's a lot that's going on that's positive. There are also some very difficult and, and, and some differences. And, you know, the, uh, the, the more assertive behavior in the, in the South China Sea and the East China Sea, uh, so some of the other things make it complex. So I, I, I look at it and say, I don't say are they a, a, a friend or a foe, I say China is, you know, and, 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 and they have a strong interest in having a important relationship with the United States, and that's a positive. And they want or looking for opportunities to work with us, and we need to find opportunities to work with them. And as again, I think the decisions our leaders make in terms of the right mix of competition and cooperation, I think, is, is, is also important. Okay, so now let me try this out. Um, China is stealing our agricultural seeds, it's stealing our IP, it's building an airstrip uh, on the Spratly Islands in the South China Seas. It's saber rattling in the Sea of Japan. It's sponsoring cyber attacks. It's promoting nationalism. So I'm obviously painting a picture. With Russia, um, our policy of, accom of accommodation, some argue, uh, actually empowered Putin. And that's proven to be disastrous now. So in retrospect, do you think that we should be tougher on China? And how would you characterize the potential risk that engagement with China um, in the future will seem misguided? Well, I don't, so I, I, I begin with, so let me start and say, I don't, the reason I don't use the word constructive engagement is because I think that has come to be a code which, which some people find offensive here. So I'm talking about practical, strategic, working with them where it makes sense, being, be, being very, you know, uh, cool and hard-nosed about the things that are interests. And so you, you listed a whole lot of things, and we would, we, we could deal with those one by one because those are, those are a series of of of, of different uh, difficult issues. Uh, I would say when I look at the economic issues, to me, the most troubling economic issues are, are the ones that have to do with, and I write about them in the book, are ones about. Uh, cyber theft, okay? Cyber gets confused and con conflated in, in a lot of people's mind because there's a whole series of cyber issues we could talk about. But the issue of breaking into the private sector companies, American companies' computers, and stealing the intellectual property and having that go for, for private sector use, to me, that is the most troubling. It goes well beyond you know, uh, backward engineering of patents and ripping off patents, because I think there's been a fair amount of you know, progress made in, in that area. And so this is, is an area that plays to all of our worst concerns about the Chinese don't play fair and so on. And it's, it's a very serious issue. And I think the way we deal with that is not only do we keep talking with them about it and keep pushing about it, but I think we have to be smart and strategic also which is we need to, to, to do a better job of hardening our own security systems, doing things that are better tactically, and that we need to deal with that on a multilateral basis. And because there needs to be global punishments for perpetrators, I don't know if it's part of the WTO process or what, but, the, um, but, but again, we, we tend to have lost the high ground here because so many other things have been conflated. There's cyber espionage, okay, which is, what major countries do to each other, the U.S. and China. Right, US and of course, they're increasingly using technology. So then there's a whole group of privacy issues, which we're debating right now. To what extent is it appropriate for a government to, to, to you know, use technology to, to look at information about either other governments or their citizens, if it's necessary for national security or, or for, um, 
you know, for, for law enforcement. Then there are the procurement issues that come out of that. You know, we wall off parts of our economy from taking on Chinese systems, whether it's Yahweh or ZTE or whatever, because of the national security concerns. And now China is looking at legislation that would do that also for big, for our technology companies. And we, somewhere we're going to have to find some balance or we're going to have huge parts of our mutual economies, uh, you know, walled off, which, which won't be good for anyone. And then you've got the, you know, you, you've got the cyber warfare where, where I, I think, you know, the U.S. and China both have a really important need to come up with protocols and, you know, to, and, and protect against, you know, the kinds of instabilities and, and real threats there are out there in terms of cyber warfare. And then you've got cyber theft. But unfortunately for us, even though I look at that as a very different issue, and I don't think anyone has been able to accuse the U.S. government of, you know, taking technology from from any co company and turning over to the private sector. This has got conflated with a whole lot of other issues, and, 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 and we certainly don't have the high ground. But it's something we really need to be pushing on. But you think that engagement is 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 important rather than more sticks as a well, long well, carrot. Well, you have to. Let me just simply say it, it, it's not that simple. The I'm for being tough when it makes sense to be tough. But you, if you have a stick, you better make sure you've got a plan to make it work. And so indicting PLA officers who are never going to see trial in, in, in the US ends up you know, backfiring and be, being tougher on our, uh, uh, on our companies. So I, I'm for being, uh, I'm for being, uh, for being, for being, doing things that are in our pragmatic interest, okay? That's why I want to work with China. When people say, why do you want to help China? I want, what I want to do is I want to help the United States of America. And the right way to help the United States of America is to have a constructive relationship with China and, and a pragmatic relationship. So to me, the biggest concern all of us should have is that for me, it's for you, it's your kids. For me, it's my grandchildren growing up in a safe, environmentally sound, uh, prosperous world. And I've got to tell you, if you look at history, what history tends to show you is when you have a major preeminent, you have a preeminent power and you have a rising power, yeah. more often than not, they come to conflict. And I think that's unacceptable and we can't let that happen. And the way not to have it happen is to, 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 to build important economic linkages when they make sense and to be strong economically, militarily, diplomatically. So again, the, those that want to simplify this thing or those that want to say, well, you know, you, U.S. policy over eight created a, a Frankenstein, I, I reject that. I, I say we, we, before we had the opening up uh, of China, Nixon and Kissinger, we had an implacable Cold War enemy. Okay, now we've got a a country that's increasingly integrated into the global economy. Hundreds of millions of people have come out of poverty, but this is a new China and we need to have new policies and we, we just be very pragmatic and strategic. But I do think also that in order to do that, we need to have a lot more interest here at home in China. And for at one point in time, China was really hot. I mean, it was a fad and it seems to be fading a little bit. Um, so how do we promote more or how do we encourage more Americans to be much more interested in China? You know, the, we, unfortunately, many Americans and uh, even members of Congress are woefully ignorant of many things outside of our country. You know, I will, when I talk with, there's a fair number of Americans that are sophisticated about other things, and they'll either say to me, they'll be very simplified, they'll say, well, I guess the Chinese are reforming and that means they want to become more like us where they think anybody that doesn't want to become more like us, they can't imagine it. They just can't imagine. And, and then there are other uh, Americans that basically say China's an enemy and we got to treat them like an enemy. And, and I think they're wrong and they're, you know, that kind of behavior will make them an enemy. And so I, I, I think the only way you do get a better understanding is having there be more uh, cross-fertilization. 
Chinese students in the U.S., U.S. students in China, cultural exchanges, Chinese presidents visiting the U.S., economic linkages. The reason I favor economic linkages, I, th I think the stronger those are, the easier it is to weather some of the, some of the security tensions. And one of the things I saw with the SED, is strategic economic dialogue, if you get some of the economic linkages and issues right, the other issues are easier to solve. Right, okay. So let's get to your chapter 19 in the book, which is a very interesting chapter. All of you should read it. Um, you seem to agree uh, you know, that Xi Jinping is trying to eradicate corruption. And of course, we all uh, agree with that. Uh, that's a great thing to do. Uh, and we've seen many campaigns to eradicate corruption in the past, and they come and they go, and they, they, they tend to fade, uh, partly because they don't systematize the eradication of corruption. They don't have the rule of law. They have the rule of man. So in your chapter 19, you say that the great driver of illicit activity is a flawed system that concentrates too much power in the, in the hands of the party and the state and leaves too wide a gap between the law and the enforcement. So in this context, do you think that Xi Jinping's campaign against corruption is different? Um, if so, why? If not, why not? Well, first of all, corruption is a huge problem. And, and it is, wherever you have corruption, it's a, it's a real tax on any economic system, on the people. And I have no doubt that Xi Jinping is very serious about this, because you know, if the party's going to survive, they're, they're going to have to make progress. And as I've had conversations with people there, I, I, I'm convinced that they understand a lot of what they need to do to deal with it. Now, th th what's going on right now, and just for p people, I know you know this, but to give people in the audience context, this is massive. It's hard to even understand it right now if you're sitting in this country. It goes to every part of the economic, social, political, part of the party. So there have been a quarter of a million people punished so far, and it's intensifying. Seventy you know, or more minister level taken out. So th th there's, there's no doubt that something like this has got people trembling, and it, and it will curb it. But it doesn't deal with the systemic causes. And I think first and foremost with the systemic cause is the government is so involved in the economy. And so there's no doubt to me that if they can do what they're trying to do, which is to have the, the markets be decisive and have the government less involved in making economic decisions, that is one longer term cure. Another, but much even more basic, is a legal system. They have a legal system. And Xi Jinping is talking about the rule of law. And you know, people on both sides, when I talk about this, I offend people on, on each side. Because first of all, there's some people in this country that don't believe you can do anything to make a legal system better if, if it doesn't apply to you know, the almost 90 million people that are in the party. But th there's no doubt in my mind that he's serious about professionalizing the legal system, having you know, district courts, federal courts, having judges that are much more professional when it comes to intellectual property and the environment, having there be more consistency, modernizing it, you know, and, and doing things where it makes it hard for the, you know, the, the party secretary at, at, at such and such a province to, to interfere with, with, with the legal system. But at the end of the day, I think that the, the ultimate cure, you know, for, for uh, for corruption is transparency. And I think transparency, having a, a free and open press, and having a legal system that applies to all. Now, they have more transparency than you might expect. And I, I, I tell one conversation, and in, in I think it's chapter 19, where I'm talking with Wang Xishang, who's driving this, and he looks at his watch. And right. we both have, and, and, and he has a, a, you know, a low cost, disposable watch, and he's explaining how all these netizens, so the, these, the Chinese public is enraged with the corruption. And so they see these officials on government salaries with these you know, $5,000 watches on their arm and driving around in Mercedes and so on. 
And so people aren't wearing these watches anymore because people are reporting them. And, 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 and so he's, he's telling me about his watch and, and how he changes the crystal and the battery. And I've told him, well, you know, mine may not cost anymore, but I haven't figured out how to do that. So when a battery goes, I throw it away and get another one. But, 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 so, but I tell the story to say that the, the public is involved and there's more transparency and you're making progress. Now, he, he, he gives me, he, he talks, we talk about an analogy about different ways of dealing with something, and he often uses a medical analogy. Yeah, right. And he, he talks about there's a, there's a, the best would be holistic medicine, which he refers to as Chinese medicine, where you would have to really get in and make major cultural changes and educational changes, change to change basic behaviors. And, and th then there's what he would call a Western, you know, uh, pharmaceutical or, or, or Western drug. And there they've got a series of programs, you know, programs against the military serving hard liquor, programs against excessive entertaining and all these kinds of things. People aren't showing up at the, at the casinos now in Macaw. But, and then there's, the last one is cutting it out, cutting the cancer out. Well, that's what this, that's what they're doing, that's what they're doing now. Right. Well, they do need a more open press, that's for sure. And Xi Jinping has rolled back, uh, you know, the kind of press openness that they had at one time. And so that actually goes against the eradication of corruption. If you had the reporters ferret out corruption in their news pages, then that could help too. But right. Well, what, what I what I describe and and and, and describe, you know, in, in what you referred to is chapter 19, which is entitled the party line, is it seems incongruous to those of us in America to say, here's a guy who's looking to change really every aspect of Chinese society and just reforms on all sorts of things, but he's got an economy that has run out of steam and needs to be reformed. Huge challenge, and he says the key is let the market be decisive. And to, to get that done is gonna be very, very difficult, but how do you have more economic flexibility and work to do that. At the same time, you're tightening up, on the, you know, you're having ideological control, uh, more control in the political system, the media, the internet. Now to him, the, it, it isn't incongruous because he looks at the party as being the source of stability. And he, so taking a hard line on anyone who he believes is going to undermine the authority of the, of, of the party, he looks at the, uh, and he looks at the party as an institution that's strong enough to drive reform. I look at it and I say that that's longer term, not a winning strategy, as you said with regard to the corruption, but I would say with regard to the economy, how do you, how, how do you, do you innovate? You know, I've in, in a different life. Nine years ago, I ran a company, yeah. and when oh, you're, in, in an information age, I don't know how you run a company where you're not connected to everything right. that's going on around the world and are successful. Right. So let's get to human rights. Um, how you were a super cabinet official, so human rights normally wouldn't fit into a treasury portfolio, but because you basically it, ran the relationship between the two countries, human rights is part of that. It fits in there. So how do we, um, as the US government, or as US officials, how do we work on, how would we incorporate human rights into um, a strategy uh, to work with China? Well, well, let me step back and just simply say, I looked at a lot of issues came under the economic umbrella. Uh, human rights, what was it, one of those, Condi and the State Department dealt with it, although I will, I will tell you a, a, a story in a minute about one instance, which I think is interesting. Right, the uh, 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 Yeah, on, on the human rights uh, spectrum. But as I look at this, first of all, I want, to, I want to say something about what she is doing and then get back to the broader issue. Because I think even though he's curbing some of these liberties and, 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 and so on, that the fact that Today, he's focusing on, if you say, what do the Chinese people care about the most? It's the dirty air, right? The corruption, the property rights where, where, where people are losing their land, 
and the conditions in which they're losing it, the food, food safety, these big income disparity issues, the household registration system. So he is, and he's effectively ended the one-child policy and forced labor. So he, uh, re-education camps. So he's doing those things, and he, I think, is going to be the issue is more and more people go to the cities and, and you have increased prosperity, they're, they're going to de demand more. Now, for, for U.S. policy, I think that to understand the United States government and policy, I think you've got to say we don't have a, a one-dimensional policy. So we, we all of us have to be speaking out, and, and the U.S. government has to be speaking out for, for, for human rights, and we always will. And if, if people say, well, is there a trade-off with the economic issue, is there a trade-off with the national security issue, I never view those as trade-offs, because when you look at you know, our continued economic success, that's a very important right. I happen to look at climate as, as you know, in terms of the risks I see to the globe, I think that's in many ways the, the most uh, basic right. When you look at curbing nuclear proliferation, that's huge. So I think it's complex. And I think how you go about doing it is, is, is interesting because on the one hand, we have to speak out and show what, we, what we're for. But when we speak out on any particular individual, if I go and, and you are a Chinese dissident in jail and I make a whole lot of noise and say, you know, I, I want Cheryl released, it, it does a lot of good throughout the world and for other people in China. But I, I guarantee it won't be successful in getting Cheryl released. And I, I tell a, a story which was, even though I didn't normally deal with these issues, where I, I tell a story about at the time I secured the release. Zhang Jianli. Yeah, of, of a guy who was a, you know, a, a pro-democracy activist. And it was, in many ways, during the financial crisis, you were talking about the dark days of the financial crisis, that was probably the one bright day I could think of in August of 2008. He came in just before we put Fannie and Freddie under. He came in with his wife and two young children and looked me in the eye and, and he thanked me for two things, which he thanked me for, for his release and then he thanked me for the work I'd been doing in China on the environment. And what connected to me was I, I had secured his release in a, a year earlier in August, and I had just made a trip to the Qinghai Plateau to draw attention to environmental issues and climate change. And I had gone and I was meeting with the Chinese leaders. And, and at, at the same time, they were thanking me for the environment and for things we were doing on the environment. And we were putting the pieces in place to put together this 10-year framework on energy and the environment which is, again, I think helps sow the seeds for what we have now with the, this climate change deal. At the same time, you know, they, they, that, that, that I was working out his, his release. So here are these, you know, both members of the, the society, you know, one, in, one opposing, but, but both, you know, grateful for the environment. So finding common ground also, I, I think, helps. But again, that's a, it, it, it's, it, it's, a con, it's, it's complex, but I always say to people, never ever look at this as a trade-off. This is, we can't run a one-dimensional policy. We need to do things which are in our interest, but we always have to be, you know, for, for, for human rights. Okay, I want to ask one more question and then open it to the audience, so please uh, think of your questions and get ready. So on a lighter note, um, you know, Hank's book is, is really fabulous with lots of details and you know, weighty topics as you've heard today so far. But he does have some lighter notes too. So I want to ask you, you give some colorful details about some of the Chinese leaders. So which of the following ones that I mentioned um, do you hope will, least, will be the least read by them? So one is spotting Zhu Rongji, who at the time was the prime minister, the premier of China, uh, in a meeting, spotting Zhu Rongji's long johns sticking out from under his pant legs, 
telling Wang Chi San, who is now on the Standing Committee, very, very senior, senior guy there, and uh, Zhou Xiaotuan, who is now who's running the central bank, telling both of them in the peak of the financial crisis, quote, we always do what we need to do, unquote, and you not really having a clue of what you're going to do. Um, or, and here's an American who said this, I guess, um, when a Chinese, uh, and you had just accepted the treasury job from President Bush, and um, a Chinese leader who you were meeting uh, called you, uh, said to you aside after, well, just in the meeting, at the end of the meeting, said, I just heard from my friend Jon Snow that you're going to be the next Treasury Secretary. And of course, you changed the subject. And your colleague, Mike Evans, then turned to you and said, why would he think that you'd leave your job as CEO of Goldman Sachs to join the sinking Bush administration? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, there are a few of those, a few of those moments. And uh, you know, your, your comment about uh, Zhu Wanji's Long Johns brings me back to a, to, to, a, to a different era. And th there, there was no doubt about it. I remember explaining, telling my wife, Wendy, when, when, when she was in one meeting, I said, look at him. This was in, you know, in February. And I said, you'll see all of their Long Johns <laughs> down there. But you know, on, on a more serious note, you know, an, an anecdote which, which, which I think is the other side of that. In the same meeting when Wang Xishong was in Washington, D.C. in June of 2008. And he, we had, I got a number of congressional leaders together with him. And they were lecturing on the environment and on climate change. And you know, I, I knew that he cared a lot about this because earlier he'd said to me, and at the time they had a, a billion people, he said, Hank, you've given us a bad model. If we had a billion Chinese people that wanted to live like you live in America, there wouldn't be enough resources left in the world. So here, when he, he'd sort of taken about what he was going to take, and he said, interesting you all are lecturing me. He said, you know, I'm staying in, it's, it's, it's 90 degrees here, it's very hot, and in my hotel room, it's so cold, I have to use a heavy blanket. He said, then I go to the fitness center, and you are, air, you are exercising in air conditioning the air conditioned on. Then you take a hot shower and go out and get an air conditioned car and you want to tell us how to behave for, for the environment. No, he has a point, absolutely. Yeah. So I want to open it up uh, to the audience for questions. Uh, anyone, please stand up. And I think there are mics as well. Yes, there are mics. So here in the front row. Thank you. Nice to see you again. Um, question. You talked a lot about the elimination of corruption inside of China itself and all the officials that we, you were discussing, but I don't think you really discussed, at least here, the impact of China working with corrupt regimes around the world and the impact of their economic investment, certainly in some places in Africa. Do you see that adjusting over time as part of this move away from the, this method of operation? Well, I'll tell you, it is a huge issue, not for them, but for everybody in the world dealing with corrupt regimes. I think there are going to be uh, two big economic phenomena, you know, coming out of China in, in the next 25 years. One, which I talk about in the book a fair amount, is urbanization, the next 300 million people going to the cities in China. And that's huge. They've already got 650 million people there, and that's going to drive environmental and eco you know, economic outcomes. The other is, is going to be Chinese companies increasingly looking to become global companies and making big investments. They've been do doing it already, but doing it to an even greater extent. And I think I keep I, I tell my Chinese, you know, friends that this is. This, these companies are going to be the lens through which the rest of the world looks at China. And as they look to develop first-rate global companies, th they need to recognize that the best companies in every industry are the ones that have not only the best governance, but the best policies in terms of hiring, training, the best environmental policies, the best policies in terms of dealing with, 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 with corruption and so on. So I, I think they're very sensitive to how they're regarded around the world. But it's a, 
this is, I, I think this is, a, again, a longer-term issue. They also, I think, are very sensitive to the fact that they are forced to go, they would say, to deal with some of the dodgier regi regimes and some of the more difficult parts of the world to get the, you know, the oil and other resources they need. And that, so I think that's another reason why they're really looking to wean themselves to a greater extent from, from, from carbon-based fuels and to have cleaner sources of energy and gas and so on. But, but it is, you know, it, it's a challenge. There was a question in the back, I believe. Right, please. If you can stand up, that would be great. Thank you very much. At a conference at this location a couple of years ago, former President George W. Bush described the scene when you and Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke came to him for the first time and said, Mr. President, we have a problem with the TED spread. Could you recall that day for us uh, at the start of the financial crisis, please? Well, I had a, a, a number of conversations with George W. Bush, and I certainly think he was talking, I'll tell you about the time he was talking about, about this. I, I want to say before even getting into that, I was really, really fortunate. I, I did not know him when I accepted the job, and that's why I think it took me th several times. I turned it down several times before I came, and I was very fortunate that I had a year to develop a relationship of trust with him beforehand. Because what I found with him, which is contrary to what there's some perceptions, was I found that he was very quick on the uptake and that he encouraged me to work on a bipartisan basis and he was prepared to do whatever it took to save our economy. And what, what he was talking about was, I, I think the time, you know, which I just was recounting with him the other day, which was not just the, the time when we were in the Roosevelt Room before deciding to go up and uh, seek the emergency powers from Congress for the TARP, but, but the time when after we had the powers we needed from Congress and almost three weeks had gone by and the situation had worsened when I went to see him and, and explain that that our, our plan wasn't going to work, and what we needed to do was something that had never been done before, as far as I knew. It wasn't just putting capital in the bank and nationalizing a few banks when they failed, but it was recapitalizing the banking system. So to get out to 700 banks, and it was something that was gonna be unpopular, because most people would say, boy, if you give the banks capital, you better really be tough on them. And of course, if we were really tough on them, the only ones that would have taken it was those that were just before they went down, like the Europeans did. And we were going to do something that was innovative. And, and, but we, 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 we always looked at that, that TED spread, and, and which was the amount of you know, risk in the financial system. And there were a couple times when we were right on the edge of, of, of collapse. Any other questions? Okay, one here. Uh. Hi, I just wondered if you could comment about the disputes China's having with the likes of Vietnam, the Philippines, Japan, over all the different islands. How do you see that playing out? I, I can't do that. Okay, can uh, you repeat that just louder? I oh, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to, if you could comment on how you see the situation with China with the Philippines, Vietnam, Japan over the different island disputes, how that's gonna play oh, out? South China Sea. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah the China China South China Sea, yep. so. I could give you a longer version or the shorter. I'll, 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 I'll try, to, try to be brief. Because the, the, the territorial disputes in the South China Sea and East China Sea are longstanding, and they involve many of the countries. It's not just China. But China has serious differences with a number of those countries. And they are very, very, uh, there's, in each country, there's really strong sentiment about these issues very strong sentiment. So the United States has taken the position that not to get involved in taking a side on the underlying merits, but being trying to be very strong that we believe these things should be decided multilaterally if, if, if possible, but clearly not with force or coercion or threatening force. 
And so as I look at some of the more assertive actions and, and you know, the islands, it's, it's, it's troubling. And, and, and I think the, the, the thing that, that I think is the most reasonable and, and concerning short-term risk is that this is a region that has benefited greatly from economic integration and the trade linkages and the investment. And I think there's, there's a real possibility that national security tensions will threaten and, and, and disrupt that. But again, you know, it's, it's very important. The United States' role is very important. And we, we have an obligation to make sure that there's freedom of navigation and the sea lanes are open and, 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 and to be very present. And the other thing to keep in mind more broadly is that we've had, and I think the whole region has benefited from a major U.S. presence there. But I, I think the Chinese find it, you know, objectionable that we're right there, you know, right off their coast surveilling. And, you know, th they're doing what, what we did and basically every other major power has done. They're building up their own military. And so I think the, the, the tricky and important thing is for us continuing to be very strong in Asia, recognizing that they're not going to let us continue to be, have, be dominant, have a hegemony. And, and we certainly, you know, uh, you know are, are going to abdicate. And so figuring out how to work through these issues together are very important. And th that's why I come back uh, repeatedly to building the economic linkages, which I think, uh, you know, have the, have the power to mitigate some of these other some of these other issues, but certainly not eliminate them. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank you all. So any of you who are dealing with China need to buy Dealing with China by Hank Paulson. So um, I think you can get the books over there, and then you are going to be doing a book signing. And where is the table that you will be? In the back there. OK, great. One more question? OK, can we get the? Here, it's coming. Hank, I have to say that I bought an electronic version, and we need to figure out a way that you can give us an e, uh, you know, signature on, on an e-book. But seriously, I think uh, you know, it's uh, fascinating we're talking about China without mentioning AIIB. But my question is really, what would be your view advising US government on strengthening the Bretton Woods World Bank, the IMF? Uh, so that uh, these institutions will continue to play a critical role in crowding in finance to emerging markets. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so let me comment on AIIB, which I'm is Asian, Asian Infrastructure. Infrastructure Investment Bank. And, and I think this is something that's been blown way out of proportion. I think this is something the Obama administration didn't get right, but no one gets everything right. So let me put this in perspective, because some people are looking at this as just some huge watershed. So put it in perspective. First of all, the US does not do infrastructure f funding. Secondly, China does more, their XM Bank and the China Development Bank does more than any of the other in institutions in, in, in this area. Uh, I've even read stories that you know, some, some people think that AIIB you know, com competes with the IMF, which never has done any infrastructure funding. And so, I really think that the right, the right U.S. policy is, first of all, to work to bring China into the, make room for them and the other institutions. And I write about it in my book, helping bring them into the, for, for instance, the Inter-American Development Bank. I also do write about the AIIB, you know, in, in the last chapter. Now, I didn't know it was going to take quite the turn it took. But I, so I believe that the right thing is to, to join and work, you know, that they're going to want to do some things too, and we should be part of that and work to make it better and, and fight for better practices. I don't happen to believe, you know, that the World Bank, as great as it is, or the other multilateral banks are the last word when it comes to infrastructure funding. We need all sorts of infrastructure in, in the world. We need smart infrastructure. We need clean infrastructure. We need well-planned infrastructure. I think some people confuse 
the governance we have at the World Bank, where you've got this expensive in-house group of, uh, of directors that really are cumbersome and confuse and complicate and slow down decision making with good decision making and making good environmental decisions. So I think the other thing we should be doing is working to transform some of these institutions so they play a bigger and more important role in, in the modern economy and looking to cooperate with China and work with China. China wasn't looking for a battle with us and we gave them an easy victory. The other thing is, you know, if, if we decide we want to fight, you know, we should have a plan to win, you know, N not fight when, you, when you're almost certain to lose. So, but, but again, this is not the, uh, th this is not some huge watershed event. This is, this is China looking to do something in infrastructure uh, finance and, 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 and I think saying, and I think we need to take them at their word and then work with them on it, that they want to do it in a first class way. And unfortunately, as you said, the U.S., we do not do infrastructure. You can tell from <laughs> yeah, yeah. our airports and our roads, we yeah. do not do infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. But China does. Right. Thank you very much, Hank. But, sure, Round sure. of applause. Cheryl, thank you very much. <laughs> I, it's my honor. Okay.